by now I think uh, you should have a fairly good idea about what a profound person, or that's my translation of the gentleman or the superior man, is or ought to be. And what is the relationship between this particular person in terms of uh, intellectual and spiritual self-definition and the political leadership. I've uh, used one quote uh, from, from Mencius. It's not easy to read, but uh, it's very significant. The term gentleman is, of course, the translation, my translation of profound person. Steeps himself in a way because he wishes to find it in himself. When he finds it in himself, he will be at ease with it. When he's at ease with it, he can draw deeply upon it. When he can draw deeply upon it, he finds his source wherever he turns. This is why the gentleman wishes to find a way in himself. In modern terminology, you can simply say there's a desire for self-definition. Normally, we do not define ourselves. And in fact, many of us are not even aware that we should define ourselves or should find our own, own way. We're open to all kinds of possibilities. We're shaped, defined, and conditioned by forces beyond our control. Normally, I simply use the term, that's structural limitation. We, each one of us is subjected to some structural limitation. I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of biological realities, such as our ethnicity, our gender, our temperament, our dispositions. These are the things we never choose. They're imposed upon us. As we grow older, we're shaped by social forces. What are the values of the society? How should we interact with other people? We're being conditioned or patterned by forces beyond our control. These uh, structural limitations are so powerful. Often we think we're doing the best for ourselves. In fact, we're simply responding to voices from the outside. Good, friendly, encouraging voices from parents, but also some social forces totally beyond our control in, in society in terms of the values of the society, the ethos, and so forth. So how to get it ourselves, to get it himself in, in this particular case, is to say how can I actually define myself in the context of a complicated relationships. And we know the mention line of reasoning. There's something there in each of us that allows us to define ourselves. We can see the goodness in us as a given. It is a potentiality. I sometimes prefer the idea of authentic possibility. It's not just potential that would never be realized, for example, but it's a certain kind of possibility that often reveals itself when we are not aware. For example, when you see a child about falling into the well, there's a feeling of commiseration. Suddenly we realize there's a lot of energy inside. So that, that sense of goodness inside, that's the authentic possibility. It's dynamic. And it has the potential, it has the capacity of, of growing. And we need to develop it. This, in a way, is the uh, very simple-minded way of characterizing the mention line of thinking about the goodness of being, or the goodness of human nature. He's not saying that human nature is factually good, so we normally do good things. That's not the argument at all. In fact, when he look around the world, there's so many dehumanizing forces that to be ordinarily human, not to say to be human in the, in the best sense of the term, is already against overwhelming odds. But this, this image of uh, getting it himself, and he can, if he feels comfortable in it, he can draw deeply upon it. The water image of source, the spring, the well-being, the spring that would, the, the water will flow. And in another, another passage, Manchu said, water from an ample source, inexhaustible supply 
of that energy or that sense of goodness, sense of being able to do things, sense of hope and so forth, comes tumbling down day and night without, without ceasing. It's always that life water going toward only after all the holes are filled and then draining into the sea. This notion about we should be able to tap inexhaustible resources within ourselves. And we certainly will have to uh, come up with a much more refined understanding of how that argument really is. Clearly, there's a sense of a vision. Vision meaning that it's, not, it's future oriented. It's something that we see ourselves to become. And it's realistic. It's not just imagined possibility. We know that we could. It's realistic. And we could even develop a program to try to achieve it. So sometimes it's programmatic. There's an approach. There's a way. And because the way is now internal to us. And that vision is a, is a guideline. It's out there, a source of inspiration, but it's not just romantic assertion about something which is not realistic. The mission then is uh, both a broadening process and a deepening process. The broadening process is to say, fine, if I can take care of myself, and without being a liability you know, to my family, to society, that, that's already a value. But that value is not good enough. I need to go beyond that. Maybe able to take care of two other people. And if we can do that, that's much more valuable than simply taking care of myself, but that's probably not good enough. We, I need to go beyond that. And you can see, not in a highly idealized science, uh, sense, but in a, both a realistic but a visionary sense, that horizon should always be extended. If there's any problem with uh, the horizon being limited, we know there's something wrong. It doesn't mean that every day we will have this uh, expanded horizon, you know, sometimes a bad day. We may feel very depressed, very uh, enclosed in our self, you know, limited self-environment. That's fine. But there's always the sense of something which is beyond. And that broadening process, from the Confucian point of view, has no limit. That's something difficult. I think eventually we'll try to come to terms with that. What does it mean, there's no limit? It means even if you extend it to the humanity as a whole, which is almost unimaginable you know, in practical terms for any of us, the Confucian would still consider it's limited because it's anthropocentrism. You know, focusing on the person, on the human, but the Confucians will have to go beyond anthropocentrism to become fully human. You know, humanity is more than anthropological. We'll have a chance to talk about that. Earlier, we talked also about the other societal structures, the family, the community, the nation, and so forth. So any notion of self-interest, profit, is legitimate in the Confucian sense. Anything we say, this is for my self-interest, for the profit of myself and others, totally legitimate. There's no problem about that. But if self-interest becomes an enclosing structure, I cannot think beyond simply that self-interest, there's some problem. Even national interest should never be used as the justification for all the actions, especially for a strong nation, for a powerful nation. Because self-interest cannot justify our being human in the present context. Because can we, gener can we universalize that principle to other societies, do not do to others what you would not want others to do to you? Now the self-interest in that sense becomes a limiting structure, which may be great for all our citizens, but certainly not good enough for us as members of a larger community, not just international global, but also the community that will involve nature, animals, and all kinds of other things. How do we move beyond that? So the mission certainly involves a broadening process. But I would suggest, eventually we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more, it's also a deepening process. Deepening self-understanding. 
the deepening process involves not only the body, but the heart and mind. I can even say the spirit and soul. What is the Confucian idea of the spirit? What is the Confucian idea of the soul? And is there afterlife? Uh, are they concerned about life after death? Are they concerned about, well, of course they're concerned about their ancestors. Uh, are they concerned about their own uh, spiritual life after that? These are issues. So we can say to realize humanity as the ultimate value of human existence is the uh, spiritual self-definition of a Confucian. So we have this, uh, this sense of mission which has been cited again and again, sometimes be become a little bit uh, uh, formulaic. Now this notion about the Confucian as a, as a knight of the way, you know, knight of, a, knight of the, uh, the round table, but knight of the way. His burden is heavy and his cause is long. He has taken humanity to be his own burden. Is that not heavy? Only when death does his cause stop. Is that not long? What does that mean in concrete terms? Is it uh, so idealistic and somehow totally irrelevant to uh, our own sense of what uh, we ought to do um, as a student or as a teacher? Now, a couple of uh, concrete examples may help to understand what, what they had in mind. One of Confucius' disciples gave very strong advice to King, and the King became a little bit uh, annoying, and he was uh, you know, overbearing. And he said, look, I'm the King, you know, I'm the ruler, in the sense that why are you giving all this lecture, all this advice to me? You should listen to me. And this disciple of Confucius said, well, there are three kinds of uh, value or authority in our country. The, uh, in the court, position is most important. You are the ruler, so you have the right to speak or to pontificate, to make pronouncements. But in our village, just in the community as a whole, age is an authority. You defer to seniority. No matter how high your official position is, if you return to your country, to your home, in the ancestral veneration, that a person who is the oldest actually has the right to make pronouncements. So age, actual age, of course, is related to the wisdom of the elder. This is uh, true for all indigenous traditions, but true in ancient China as well, age. But in our community, the community of Confucians, virtue is actually the most valuable. I'm older than you are, of course, by implication, I'm also more virtuous. And so I have two values against your one, so I can actually lecture you. Earlier, these, uh, the Confucians inherited this notion about immortalities. There are three ways to become immortal in a society, the Confucians understood. One way to become immortal is through the word, especially writing. I don't know if you've seen the bamboo strips, you know, the Gazette uh, had a, a series of uh, bamboo strips. You should get a chance to see it maybe two weeks ago. These bamboo strips, exactly how the Book of Mencius, the Book uh, the Analects were put together. So if they're good words preserved in the bamboo strips or in its silk, and they can be referred to for a long time after you passed away, you become immortal through your word. And that word becomes the collective memory of the society. Uh, the Confucians are very serious about texts, you know, the great, the sixth uh, classics, so, so to speak. And these texts, each of these texts, contained uh, wisdom through the written word. So one way of becoming immortal is to be able to contribute to the collective memory of the culture. Writers are greatly honored in that sense. Of course, great words spoken orally could be transcribed and like Confucius' words in the Analects, then eventually become immortalized. And the second one is deed. Your meritorious accomplishment. You build an institution. 
uh, educational institution, political institution, social institution, civic institution, and institution lasts more than you do and you become immortalized. You know, John Harvard is immortalized because of this institution, <coughs> so to speak. There's all kinds of ways of becoming immortal, again, through building institutions. But most valuable in the Confucian tradition is virtue. How do we understand that? How can one become immortal through virtue? That's another very interesting issue. You know, I mentioned earlier that the German scholar uh, Karl Jaspers in 1948 talked about four paradigmatic personalities. These, personality, these four personalities shape human history in a way that's unprecedented and unrivaled. We, can, we should add a few more, but uh, he mentioned particularly Socrates, uh, Buddha, Jesus, Confucius. We should add Moses or Muhammad, and maybe more recently Gandhi and others. Each one of them, the so-called paradigmatic personality, becomes an example or paradigm of certain form of ethic or virtue. It is in this sense that Houston Smith argues that prophets are capable of outlasting politicians. And these prophets continue, the prophets basically with a, uh, not just a, a religious vision, but also an ethical presence. That's through virtue. Later we'll get a chance to talk about the, the soft power. In this way that some people say Confucian ethics, it's virtue ethics like Aristotelian ethics. But there's one caveat. It is virtue ethic. Cultivation of virtue is important. Unlike the Aristotelian way, which is more Xunzian, next week we would encounter uh, Manchester's rival, Xunzi. it's more in the Xunzi tradition. That is, virtue is habit. You try to internalize some ways of doing things, and if they become so internalized, become your habit, then you become virtuous. You, you cannot be virtuous without this process of habitualization. Manchus' argument is very different. It's not simply to acquire certain kind of values from outside and to internalize them, but to find the source within, to appeal to that, quote, goodness, which not only a potentiality, but an authentic possibility and a dynamic process which is the human heart, human heart and mind. And through there, of course, habits are important, but habits are secondary to our awareness of the internal resources that we have. In this sense, there's a major debate, and sometimes D.C. Lau, you know, his translation of Mencius, says sometimes it's difficult to, to follow the argument between nature, what is our nature and destiny, what is heaven's decreed? An interesting statement in, uh, in Mencius is as follows. The way of the mouth disposed to its taste, the eye to its colors, the ear to its sound, the nose to its smells, and the four limbs to its ease is human nature. Yet, there's also, there also lies the decree or destiny. Now, which means that we like, we like good taste, we like to see beautiful colors, fragrant smells, and to, to make us comfortable. All these sensory perceptions, all these instinctual, instinctual demands are part of our human nature. Manchus doesn't deny that at all. But there's also a decree, there's also destiny in the sense that whether we can satisfy all these instinctual demands depend upon some external conditions sometimes we cannot control. That is why, I follow the, uh, the statement, that is why the gentleman does not describe it, describe all these instinctual demands as nature. Okay. The way benevolence pretends to the relationship between father and son, duty to the relationship between prince and subject or ruler and sub minister, to the relationship uh, between prince and subject, the rights to the relationship between guests and host, wisdom to the good and wise man, 
the sage to the way of heaven. It's the decrease. Whether someone is able to cultivate this relationship depends upon external condi uh, conditions. Where your father behaves fatherly, you cannot totally be responsible. Whether the ruler behaves benevolently, the ministers are not necessarily responsible. They are conditions. So there's a decree. But there's also, uh, but there also lies human nature. There's also part of nature. That is why the gentleman does not describe it as destiny or as decree. I don't know whether I made myself clear. Let me, let me revisit this. This is absolutely critical as a major choice in the mansion line of thinking. All the instinctual demands we saw, you know, physiological, biological conditions, these things are part of our nature. But Mencius, in a strange way, argues that the profound person refuses to consider them as our nature. Our nature is not defined in terms of our sex, appetite, all these instinctual demands, even though they are our nature. Our nature is born with these uh, biological realities. Now, virtues of benevolence, of humanity, of, of wisdom, of rights, of uh, sagehood, these cannot be accomplished simply by appealing to our nature, instinctual demands. No, not at all. They have to be acquired, and sometimes it's very difficult for us to acquire any of them because they're external conditions. And yet, the choice here is to refuse to consider them as destiny or external condition, but insist that they should be considered as part of our nature, as our nature. So the strange notion about nature or good, goodness of nature is to have a very specialized way of understanding what nature is, what human nature is. Is that persuasive? Is that allowable? Is that so idiosyncratic that we cannot you know, relate meaningfully, you know, scientifically unprovable, factually uh, unde undemonstrable? Uh, maybe, maybe you should stop a little bit, he, uh, stop here, see if you, if you have any, any uh, questions. What, what is your, your response to this particular notion about human nature, uh, about human heart and mind? You have, a, you have a question for me first, or not? Oh, it's, it's very clear? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's one way of doing it. All the, all the instinctual demands we have are natural, right? To seeing good color and so forth. And men should say, the profound person will not regard them as nature. So by inference, the virtues we just outlined, these virtues, they're not part of our nature, right? We have to learn. But now the profound person says, no, these are our nature. These are not decreed. These are not determined by external things. Is it persuasive? Is it so weird that it's very difficult to, uh, you know, to say anything about it? Yes? <laughs> That's a very, very interesting question. I think, can we be profound persons, right? Or someone out there with a very strange view that in order to make him more capable of cultivating these virtues, he simply say, look, these are all part of our nature. Almost, I think your notion is almost like a strategy. Strategy for achievement. To say, these are my nature, so they will become more palatable. I probably can be disciplined, forced to do that, right? So. Is that the strategy that is involved in Mencius? The curious way is that uh, the overwhelming majority of East Asian intellectuals for the last 800 years accepted the Mencius position. Right? It's so, so strange, so odd to us. But they all accepted it. So, yeah, that's the right way of doing it. Yes? Yeah. 
you mean believed audience, did you say? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, that, this is an, another, another very interesting observation, very good observation. They actually talk to the like-minded people, you know, they convert it. Like the Christians talking to Christians, the Muslims talking to Muslims. So you really don't have to explain a lot of things. You don't have to explain that, uh, you know, uh, Jesus is God in, incarnate. You don't have to explain to the Virgin Mary and m many of these. Basically, they're part of, the, part of the ethos. Everybody accepts it. Now, Confucius did address these issues to uh, his students or disciples. Presumably, they were interested in what he had in mind. But as I pointed out earlier, nothing in the Confucian text is not beyond question. Nothing is taboo, or nothing is dogma. You really can. So Confucius actually, what is, what is his position? Is his position very clear in your mind, reading the Analects, that human natures are naturally good or not? In a way, Confucius is not clear on that issue. Uh, Fingeret's interpretation is very different. You know, Fingeret actually considers Mencius as a deviation from the Confucian line. So he probably considers Xinjian next week we deal with is a, is, a, is a better way. Now, I want to suggest, I'm not going to convince you, I'm sure, <laughs> that Mencius and Confucius address these issues as general human issues, not to specific group of, groups of people, not to believers. Uh, they can be just as uh, cynical or as, you know, psychology of suspicion is very important, cynical as questioning, as, uh, um, you know, open to all kinds of possibilities, as pluralistic as many of us are. So the question is, with this line of thinking, in some way, wh where does its persuasive power really lie? And is there some way do we really understand how the argument really is? The position here is to say these virtues, humanity, rights, and these virtues, in terms of the most basic orientation, you know, how can we acquire these virtues? It's not because they are good virtues for society against our nature. Because these virtues, the roots of these virtues, the beginnings, the germs of these virtues are rooted in our heart and mind. It is really a part of us. If it is not part of us, we try to find some kind of forces from the outside to convince us they are virtuous. Then that kind of inquisition would not be able to fully realize the human potential. They are inherent in us. Well, one argument I tried to formulate earlier is that uh, you, can, you can argue very, in a very general sense that the ability to feel, the ability to will, the ability to know, and the ability to sense, these are human capacities. It's not possible to find any human being who's incapable of feeling. And then, this, if, if you accept, you know, feeling is not something you learn. You feel. You can feel. That's part of your, I don't know how many will argue the, against it. Maybe there are, any, any of you see, will say, you have to learn to feel. You just, you just, it's not possible to see anyone who is by nature capable of feeling. Now, to know, knowing, or willing, I will, willing. You don't have to accept uh, Schopenhauer or Nietzsche and others about the will to power. To be able to will is part of human. Now, if that's the case, the f the, uh, let's, let's focus in on feeling. It's capable of feeling. There's all kinds of feelings, but one kind of feeling which is the most significant in terms of virtue ethic, most significant for human, and that is compassion. That is commiseration. That is sympathy. And if you say, I have to learn to be sympathetic, learn to be empathetic. If I don't learn, I think some of you may accept the view. I have to learn because if, uh, if I don't have a chance to learn, I will never become sympathetic or empathetic. That's quite, quite all right. 
As you know, uh, Jaron Kagan, one of our colleagues in psychology, well, in his argument, he, he finally decided that the most basic, um, basic feeling for virtue in the human community is the feeling of sympathy, which occurred, which became manifested in the human experience around the age of two. They're capable of expressing some kind of sympathetic feeling. Rationality will come much later, but feeling comes much earlier. But of course, this is uh, always debatable. So the direction is clear for the confusion. And again, it is, uh, it is made in a, in a very grandiose, uh, grandiose uh, manner. The profound person from a mentioned point of view, someone who lives in a spacious dwelling, which is humanity, occupies the proper position, which is his own sense of niche in the society, and goes along the highway of the empire, which is the idea of right, uh, rightness. Now the next, next one is interesting. When he achieves his ambition, he shares these with the people. When he fails to do so, he practices the way alone. He cannot be led into excesses when, well, with, uh, when wealthy and honored, or deflected from his purpose when poor and obscure. Nor can he be made to bow before superior force. This is what I would call a great person. So in this sense, the ability to define ourselves, define who we are, and allow the external conditions to be conditions for us to use, to appropriate, but sometimes to fight against, but never lose the sense of this direction. And lose the sense of this direction, then your, your path towards uh, morality will be extremely limited. Now you can read Mencius the whole book of Mencius, as a defense of this position, as a defense for this position, but also as a justification for what Mencius considered to be his profession, his class, and his vocation. The whole book is just a book of defense, who, who, what kind of person you want to become. Now, the defense began with uh, a very simple notion, I think most of us will accept. The simple notion is that any complicated modern society or any society requires division of labor. There ought to be a lot of different people doing different things. It's very easy to justify the existence of those who actually produce and render service to society. The farmers, the artisans, and the merchants. Later, of course, the kings would say the soldiers, the bureaucrats, the officials. It's very easy to justify their existence. You don't have the farmers, we don't have things to eat. Livelihood will be in danger. We don't have artisans. You know, uh, I hope you will revisit that very important and extremely significant exchange between Mencius and a physiocrat. Physiocrat meaning a person who believes that all the values came from the land. So this is a, a very interesting debate. And someone said, look, the best way to govern the country is that everybody will be involved in uh, agri agricultural ac activities. Even the king should till the land, otherwise the king shouldn't, shouldn't be allowed to eat. So agriculture is the only base basis. So Manchester said, that's fine, but uh, you till the land with your hand or with an implement? So, oh, of course with an implement. What kind of implement? An iron implement. So you need a smith or someone to, to really uh, make the implement for you to till the land, right? You tear the land uh, uh, naked, or you, you have to wear clothes, <laughs> or, or you wear, wear a hat, or then you need weavers. So gradually, Mencius made it very explicit. You need to have division of labor to make the society work. Now, but this is a major jump. So we all produce something. We manufacture something. We exchange goods. We make the society work. Uh, you know Durkheim, this great sociologist, made a distinction between organic solidarity and uh, mechanic solidarity. Mechanic solidarity is a society that the differentiation or the division of labor is very limited. Everybody is doing the same kind of thing in a, in a primitive commune, for example. Organic solidarity depends upon highly differentiated 
way of doing things. You have many, many different professions, many different ways of doing things. Then the collaboration of these different professions eventually will make the society work. Now, Mencius certainly has this notion. But it's not difficult to justify the people who are actually involved in production. But how do you justify people who labor with their minds rather than labor with their, with their strength, with their muscles? Mencius certainly was not justifying the existence of uh, a group of philosophers, like in Greek philosophy, that the contemplative mode of life, you have to have slave society. A lot of people will have to support the livelihood. So there are few people that will be able to totally indulge themselves in philosophical speculations, philosophical reflection. This is not the argument. But it comes a little bit close to that. That is to say, in our modern sense, in addition to productivity, there should also be a service sector in the society. But the service, we can even say, men should say, labor with mind and labor with uh, strength. The people who labor with strength will be managed by the people who labor with mind. But the people who labor with their minds will be fed by people who labor with their strength. And if they do not manage well, they should not be fed. And in a sense, it is justified to be rebellious and even justified to do revolution. You have to get rid of those people who are supposed to serve, are supposed to manage, and they fail to do that. And we can't get rid of them. So the idea of revolution in, uh, in the classical, this Gemin, the idea of the changing of the mandate, in classical Chinese is really from Mencius. And the idea of revolution is really predicated on the belief that heaven sees as the people see, and heaven hears as the people hear. If the people are not happy, if the people's livelihood is being threatened, then they should rebel and they should uh, engage themselves in a revolution. Now the question is, again, where is the niche? Where is the niche for these scholars, for mentions? They are not bureaucrats, they are not officials, they are not rulers. They are not farmers, they are not artisans, they are merchants. They are not merchants. Should there be, should there be a niche for this group of people to function? And the argument, of course, from the mentioned point of view, not only there should be, it's absolutely necessary. And we also know, at least on the surface, that if you read, read mentions, the exchange with kings, with rulers, appear to be very arrogant, sometimes eloquent, but very, very arrogant. Why? Why was he able to be so... It's very difficult to imagine that in la later part of Chinese history, you know, the pre-modern Chinese history, why he was so... Sometimes he was given gifts and he returned. Sometimes you know, he, he traveled with entourage, a large group of people, and traveled from place to place, and would be able to engage himself in all kinds of conversations and get paid for, and felt totally justified. What, are, what were the sources? Sources of personal understanding or the, the group identity of, uh, of Mencius and his disciples? First of all, they really believe they were transmitters of a cultural tradition. They're major cultural transmitters. So they say, okay, you, you have your, your power, you have your strength, you, you have your you know, military might, but I have something that you do not have. I have the ancient way of managing the world. And I am a disciple of a long tradition, and that long tradition has established itself as an important ingredient of society precisely because this group of people serve as the conscience of society, as a conscience of the society in the sense of they will be able to articulate the feelings, the concerns, the needs of the people who are generally the subjects of the country, the overwhelming majority of the people. We can, in a curious way, we can represent their voice. And we are able to represent their voice precisely because we are not part of the establishment, in the sense of not part of the power elite. Not part of the... Uh, uh, no, some people consider that Confucians try to become part of a power elite 
to justify their existence. But the mentioned position is that the reason we can justify our existence as conscience of the people is because we follow an ancient way of humane government which is not being practiced. So we can serve as critics critics of the political system, the protesters in a way. This is the reason why it is absolutely necessary to find one's own way, to have one's own self-definition. If you cannot define yourself in this power relationships, you can be easily co-opted because your livelihood will be dependent upon the generosity of these rulers. The most you will become is an advisor or part of a think tank. You couldn't, you couldn't serve as conscience of the people or conscience of society without a sense of inner direction. Uh, we'll have a chance to discuss a little bit more concerning this, not just an uh, inner sense of uh, direction, but also there's a transcendent referent. Transcendent referent is a reference to heaven, linked to the whole idea of the mandate of heaven. What we do is not simply to serve the people, to be transmitters of culture, we also are, are really doing heaven's will. There's certain kind of covenants between heaven and the human community as a whole, and we are able to articulate that relationship. This is, this is the reason when the people ask about the role of the scholar, Manchu said, look, the person when he passes, there's certain kind of a, in, uh, certain kind of influence. And that influence cannot be quantified in our modern terms, but yet the influence is absolutely critical. The reason is because he's in the same stream as heaven above and earth below. There's a prophetic, you know, prophetic voice, but also what, what these people try to do is not simply human in the very narrow sense, narrow anthropological or anthropocentric sense. This is something that heaven wills that we do. There's a sense of the human as co-creators of the cosmic process. Eventually that idea became fully developed, but in Manchu it's already uh, quite clear. Now in this sense then, governance, governance is not the business of the ruler and the bureaucrats. Governance involves the continuous participation of the engaged scholar of the profound person. And they all agreed at the time that economic well-being is absolutely essential for the stability of any political system. So often this idealism, you know, this idealism is imposed upon themselves, not upon the people at all. There's no demand of the people to become virtuous, virtuous before they are well fed. It is absolutely necessary for the people to have their sus sustenance as a precondition for political stability. Any kind of uh, ideological imposition of any values on the, on the society, including these great virtues we're talking about, turn out to be counterproductive. And yet society cannot flourish only with economic well-being. Social harmony is very critical. You know, we're talking about agriculture-based economy, family-centered social structure, and paternalistic government. Now people say that's the condition, that's the context in which this idea arose. Is it ap applicable to a non-agriculture-based economy, non-family-centered social structure, and democratic society which is not paternalistic? Now, these are the issues we need to explore. But one thing, I will end with uh, this last point. One thing that to me is quite intriguing is what we call the exercise of soft power. You know, the, uh, in the Kennedy School, uh, Joe Nye, who's the dean of the Kennedy School, has developed this notion. We've been discussing this for some time in terms of uh, leadership, especially public leadership. It's very difficult for me to uh, find a way of describing, especially in modern terms, what this uh, soft power is all about. And uh, you can say the soft power has something to do with influence. Uh, the influence is not felt 
by the people who are subjected to the soft power as coercion. So this is shared experience or you share the same myth, maybe share the same story and it's not manipulative. Soft power can be manipulative. Now in our modern psychology suspicion you can use the soft power, you know, ideological, cultural conditioning as manipulative. It's not manipulative. It's the participation in a kind of uh, participation in a ritual and without even knowing that you're being influenced by that. It's difficult for me to find an analogy, and, uh, but I want to try this time. Uh, I walk across uh, Harvard Yard and uh, you know where the Science Center is. If we enter Harvard Yard from the Science Center, there's a statement on the wall by Emerson. I, I don't know any of you have seen that statement. Okay. Let me use that as to, de as to demonstrate what we have in mind in terms of soft power. The short statement reads, this is Emerson who wrote his in his journals in 1836. I went to the college jamboree on the 8th instant, which is uh, the, the uh, graduate ceremony. A noble and well thought of anniversary. The pathos of the occasion was extreme and not much noted by the speakers. Cambridge at any time is full of ghosts. But on that day, the anointed eye saw the crowd of spirits that mingle with the procession in the vast spaces. Year by year, as the classes proceeded, and then the far longer trend of ghosts that follow the company of men that wore before us, the college honors and laureates of the state, and the long winding trend reaching back to eternity. Now, he's describing a simple event, the simple event of a graduation, people just walking through a graduation to the yard. But he perceived in that procession, not just the graduating seniors, but in the spaces, there were all kinds of ghosts of the earlier people, of the others who receive honors, of all the other uh, contributors to the well-being of a particular community. Now imagine this. What's the difference between a procession that is on a very short history with no glorious past at all and a procession with just incredible amount of uh, not just important memory but actual participation of all kinds of uh, perceived and the real honors and ideas. So the difference between brute force, coercion, is that it's quantifiable, it's legal, and it's clear. The influence of the soft power is that you're in that ethos. You're in it without knowing you're in it and you are being affected by it. Only the anointed eye or the tuned ear can hear, can see, but you're influenced. And that influence depends upon your willing participation in that ritual. If you're not willing participant of that ritual, you don't feel it at all. If you are in it, then you can feel it. Now, in the analects, there's a statement that uh, the virtue of the profound person is like the wing. And the virtue of the people in general is like the grass. The wing passes, the grass cannot choose but bend. That notion about inference, you know, the grass, of course, is very resilient. So the kind of bending of the wing is not coercion. It's just the wing passes, you become, you become influenced. Now, soft power in this sense is that it's related to the meaning structure of a society. It's not the economic issue, it's not simply political stability and social harmony. It's why we're here. What is the meaning of being a part of this community? And then the meaning structure has to be not just maintained, has to be continu continuously renewed, revitalized by the group of people who are conscientious about this process. So Mencius really believe that the Confucian scholars play such a role. Not simply as, uh, you know, this, this is the meaning of the conscience of the society. Not simply as 
uh, people who labor with their strength, you no, know, to govern the people who labor with their strength, with a certain kind of manipulative power, which could be understood as a soft power. It is really the participation in a, in a ritual as governance, and the people will be influenced by these particular ideas without necessarily knowing why they are being influenced. And yet the willing participation of the people is, is guaranteed because the persuasion is based upon, I call it, standard of inspiration. You know, standard of inspiration is different from imitation. You don't Im imitate. It's just, just exemplary. And that influence becomes uh, sometimes visible, sometimes invisible, becomes a very important part of the whole process.